Hi everyone, and thank you for joining the first of two connected sessions, which ask what more can business do to tackle inequality? My name is Jill Hind, and I'm the EY Global Corporate Responsibility Leader. Among other things, that means I have the privilege of leading EY Ripples, a global program through which EY aims to positively impact 1 billion lives by 2030. A cornerstone of that ambition is working with impact entrepreneurs and the wider impact entrepreneurship ecosystem to help scale some of the best ideas and boldest actions for tackling inequality. Much has been said and written about why we need to bring about a more inclusive and sustainable economic system, one that's intrinsically fairer, more trustworthy, and more capable of addressing humanity's most profound challenges. By contrast, there's very little out there about how we can make that happen. And as critical actors in forging that system, what businesses should be doing differently. Building on the work with the World Economic Forum International Business Council and support for the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican, that's why EY teamed up with Acumen last year to create an inclusive business playbook. We want to equip businesses of all sizes, not just with a practical framework for action, but also the inspiration to act, courtesy of the stories of leading impact entrepreneurs who are already lighting the road ahead. Key insights from that work are what I'd like to introduce to you today. At EY, we're all about asking better questions, because the better the question, the better the answer, and the better the world works. And the point of the framework in the playbook is to help answer this one question. How might businesses embed serving the needs of low-income and marginalized communities more deeply across all aspects of purpose, strategy, and operations? If tackling deepening inequality is central to inclusive capitalism, then it surely follows that an authentic commitment to inclusive business demands a more systemic focus on meeting the needs of low-income and marginalized communities. As the framework in the playbook illustrates, this is not only because of innovating to make access to life-enhancing products and services more equitable and more affordable, it also extends across multiple dimensions of purpose, strategy and operations, from providing opportunities for decent employment, to distributing value more equitably throughout the supply chains, to broadening participation in governance and ownership, so looking across this canvas, the playbook offers actionable ideas and prompts for guiding businesses' thinking and decision-making, no matter their starting point. So for businesses just beginning to think about a more systemic approach to inclusion, there are ideas of where to start. For those that have already made significant progress, there are prompts for how to further accelerate this transition. So for example, in relation to supply chains, how might companies use procurement to promote dignity and fairness through commitments to uphold human rights and promote supply diversity? And how might they go even further to incentivize shared prosperity? For example, by doing business with companies that pay a living wage. Further inspiration to take those steps is provided in the form of eight case studies. So drawn from past EY Entrepreneur of the Year winners and Acumen investees. These not only serve to illustrate the principles of the framework in action, but also provide deeply personal accounts where leaders have been challenged to face and innovate new business models and how they've overcome them. One of those case studies featured is the story of Tony Chocolonely and his chief chocolate officer, Henk Jan Beltman. And I'm thrilled that he's agreed to share some of that story with us firsthand. So over to you, Henk Jan. Hello, my name is Henk Jan Belpan. I'm the Chief Chocolate Officer of Tony's Chocoloni. And realize if you are the boss of a chocolate company, then everybody in the bar and in the kindergarten want to talk to you, right? That's me, the boss of a chocolate company. But we're just not a normal chocolate company. We're an impact company that makes chocolate for a reason, and I'll tell you why. If you realize that most cocoa comes from Western Africa and that millions of farmers produce cocoa beans, they are being sold to around 10 companies around the world. And those 10 companies produce billions and billions of bars. Hopefully, you buy one of those bars each and every day. So it's actually an hourglass, right? The beginning of the value chain, 
millions of farmers and then 10 cocoa uh, 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 producing companies and then billions of consumers who, who consume those bars each and every day. If you realize that today there's poverty at the beginning of the value chain of cocoa, that has to change. Then the best way to change it is with those 10 big chocolate companies. Companies like Barry Callebaut, Cargill, Mai, but also like Mondelez, Hershey, uh, Nestle and uh, of course Tony Chocolone. Because if you realize that consumers pay around 3 euros for a bar in a supermarket, while for the cocoa content of that bar, farmers just get, only get 16 euro cents. That is poverty. And is that mean? Is that unequally divided? Yes, it's definitely unequally divided, but it's not mean. Because the value chain that we organize today, think in percentages. So first there's the farmer, they sell it to a licensed buying company, they sell it to an exporting com company, they sell it to a producing company, and they sell it to a molding company, and they sell it to a retailer, and the retailer sells it to a consumer. And each and every step in the value chain takes a certain percentage on top of the initial beans. And if you realize that that percentage, if it stays the same, becomes more and more and more each step forward on the value chain. So if we pay the farmer, let's say, one cent more for the cocoa beans, then the bar ends up in store for maybe 20 or 25 cents more. So what happens is, in this commercial value chain, everybody starts negotiating. Negotiating buying prices down and selling prices up. And the only one who cannot negotiate on buying prices is the farmer. Because the conversation between a farmer and a tree is a short conversation. So poverty starts at the beginning of most value chains and real wealth is being made at the end of a value chain. Therefore, we have to take the responsibility as the end of the value chain over the whole value chain and not only the last bit. To eradicate all illegal labor from the value chain, it is our responsibility, right? We have to make sure that the source that produces great bars, the cocoa beans and the cocoa farmer, don't work with illegal labor. That there are no kids working in the field to produce cocoa beans. And illegal labor is all worst forms of child labor, including child work. And that is something that needs to be eradicated. And everybody understands that. But if you want to change that value chain, you don't have to talk to the brain, you have to talk to the heart. Therefore, we got a little clip. Je suis comme ça me félix. J'ai 16 ans. J'ai travaillé dans une plantation de cacao de 1999 en 2003. Je m'appelle Kam Koy Herman. J'ai 18 ans. J'ai travaillé à la plantation de cacao 1999 en 2003. Je m'appelle Kam Touré. J'ai 18 ans. J'étais travaillé dans la plantation à 99. Je n'étais pas payé. J'étais forcé de travailler. J'étais forcé de travailler. Je n'avais pas la liberté pour quitter les coins. On ne m'a pas payé. On m'a forcé de travailler. Et puis on ne vous laisse jamais causer entre parents. Si on te voit causer avec ton parent, bon, on te tue ou bien. Tu te tu, mat très bien là et puis on te fait changer de compte. It's unbelievable, right? Those kids are not stupid. Those kids didn't have the same chance like you and me. And if you realize that those kids don't, are not educated and they don't want to work in the field that they have to work in, and that you can buy a child from anywhere between 200 and 300 uh, US dollar, you can buy a child in West Africa to work in the field as a slave. That doesn't make any sense and has nothing to do with eating a bar of chocolate. So back in the days, in the year 2001, Senator Harkin and Senator Engel came together in the US State Senate and they actually said it's the responsibility of all big chocolate companies to eradicate illegal labor from the value chain of cocoa. They signed everybody, all the big companies, 
all the CEO of the big companies on personal notice. And what happened is that the Harkin Engel protocol should take care of that issue. In the year 2004, a journalist from Holland came and he said, how far are we? Three years down the line on the Harkin Engel protocol, all illegal labor should be eradicated within 10 years. How far are we? And he found out that none of the big chocolate companies wanted to talk to him. So then he thought, well, if I am a journalist and I want to eradicate illegal labor from the value chain of cocoa, then I have to set an example. And an example is, if you want to buy a bike out of the hands of a junkie in Amsterdam, it's probably stolen, right? And we call it fencing. It's a criminal activity and fencing a bike is an illegal act. If you start buying a chocolate bar, go to a supermarket and buy a conventional chocolate bar, you are aware of the fact that there is illegal labor inside 3% of the beans actually come from illegal labor. So you are fencing a chocolate bar. Turn rang 911, pick me up. I committed a criminal act, somebody has to take care of that. And he said, we as uh, chocolatiers and we as journalists, we have to change and make the world a nicer place. That's how Tony Chocolonely got started. Because, uh, the other way around. That's how Tony Chocolonely got started. Teun is two Dutch name that became Tony's. The lonely battle of Teun to change chocolate from the inside out, Choco Lonely. And then, all of a sudden, you're this tiny mosquito wanting to change the world. And if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room. That's what Anita Roddick told us. And that's what we do. We want to change the big chocolatiers. We're crazy about chocolate and serious when it comes down to people. Five kind of people. Firstly, our own team, the farmers, consumers, uh, customers and suppliers. And together with governance, uh, and governments, uh, we can change chocolate forever. It's naive and arrogance, but I fundamentally believe that we can change chocolate. And we should. Most bars are equally divided. Doesn't make any sense. And if the marketeer is really creative, he puts his own name on every piece of the chocolate bar. Our bar is unequally divided. And in the bar, there's West Africa. Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo Benin, Nigeria and Cameroon. Five pieces. But Togo Benin are two countries. Yeah, otherwise it didn't fit the hazelnut, so we merged the two countries together. We do have a roadmap towards 100% slave-free chocolate and that roadmap is real easy. At first we have to create awareness for the issue because if people don't know they don't want to change and they cannot change. Secondly, we want to set an scalable example and that's what Tony's does. It has to be successful, it has to work at scale so that other chocolatiers can take their responsibility seriously so that together we can eradicate all illegal labor from the value chain of cocoa. And that is naive that's arrogance, but I fundamentally believe we will make it happen within 10 years from today. And every company should have a purpose, right? You should have a purpose to make the world a nicer place. And don't call us a social enterprise. We're an enterprise. And companies that don't make the world a nicer place are just anti-social enterprises. Don't push us in a niche. They are in a niche. Let's make the world a nicer place together so that the 2 million farmers that work in cocoa today and the 90, million children that are, uh, 90 000 children that are doing illegal work uh, will be eradicated from the value chain of cocoa and find a prosperity in the future. Thank you very much. Huge thanks to Henk Jan for sharing some of Tony's chocolate stories. What's most inspiring, I think, is the way that Tony's purpose of making slave-free chocolate the norms not only encompasses in his own practices, but those of an entire industry. It's working to transform the system from within, not shying away from challenges in West Africa, but tackling them head on to show that change is possible even in the hardest places. To find out more about Tony's story and those of seven other inspiring enterprises, I'd strongly encourage you to download the playbook and read it in full. The world urgently needs business model innovation that prioritizes social justice, economic inclusion, and environmental regeneration. This is where impact enterprises already live, and it's why a key focus of EY Ripples is extending the value of EY knowledge and networks 
to help them achieve true scale and significance. For a good example of how, do join us for the Impact Hive live session a little later today, where we'll be crowdsourcing ideas to help a SOCAP scholar overcome critical barriers to scale. And do please stick around for the kitchen table conversation that follows this, along with friends from Acumen, SAP, Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican, and Ansar ma Management Company, another impact enterprise also featured in the playbook. So together we'll be continuing the conversation about what more business can do to tackle inequality, to embrace ESG as innovation, as an innovation opportunity of our lifetime and to transform organizations of all sizes into sustainable, resilient businesses that really create long-term value for all stakeholders. So thanks so much for listening and, and I really do hope that our paths cross again.